Okay, we're going to get started. Um, and uh, one of the issues that is um, front and center in all of the um, regional uh, summits uh, is uh, the connection between uh, diversity and innovation, um, not only in terms of gender, but in terms of age, uh, et cetera, at think tanks and how that uh, is, needs to be a very conscious um, effort. Um, and so uh, Anu has a agreed to do a presentation in a broader context in terms of policy, uh, but it is um, very much in keeping with um, the uh, efforts that we're attempting to raise in terms of the number of women that are not only uh, in, in think tanks, uh, but are uh, what I described in the global summit in Brussels um, is uh, breaking the glass ceiling in the ivory tower uh, and how we need to meet those challenges. Uh, it is both a challenge for think tanks, but uh, broader society. The other thing that I would mention is on January 31st, um, the 2018 Global Go To report will be launched, but more importantly, now is an annual event and part of embedded in the discussions we had today um, is re making the case, having uh, the public have a greater understanding of why facts and think tanks matter, which is the theme this year. So I encourage all of you, uh, any of you who would like to host a session on the 31st just to let me know and we will incorporate you into the overall program. There are now over 100 think tanks that have already signed up, many beyond that who have, are, are repeating from previous years. Um, and it's totally organic in terms of uh, what makes sense within your uh, context. Um, and it can be as simple as organizing a panel, but the ob objective is to um, engage a, a larger audience in why facts and think tanks uh, matter and making that case uh, through a variety of forums and to create a global so there will be over 200 institutions in about 160 countries that will all on either the depending in terms of Asia and other time zones the January 30th or the 31st and there will be an international uh, meeting quite consciously to send a message to Washington. So normally in Washington, it's just U.S. think tanks, but this year uh, I've invited um, think tanks from around the world, and IFRI, um, Tomos Gomar, will be, be attending, uh, and uh, a whole host of others to send the message that it's not just that think facts and think tanks matter um, around the world uh, and to send a message of the importance of collaboration and cooperation uh, between think tanks and hopefully uh, President Trump will be taking note. So with Our second session this morning is uh, on women helping to power economic growth and development in India. And very rightly, uh, Anu Madgaukar is uh, going to make a presentation on this. Like James said, breaking the glass ceiling from the uh, ivory towers. Anu uh, represents a global consulting firm, which is, uh, if we look at the percentile wise, uh, women are very, very scattered very scattered women. So she, she would uh, be uh, able to give us a first-hand uh, account of how for 20 years she's been able to survive in that. And uh, uh, it is, of course, uh, diversity uh, of gender. But uh, uh, here in India, I find that more and more women have been able to break glass ceiling, not only uh, you know, in one profession, but particularly for media, which I represent. When I joined about almost four decades ago, I was told to go back home on day one when I came to join. And they said, what are you doing here? So I was just out of college, and I said that was not a very good welcome. But then, uh, you know, 
I went on, I was among the first women to have joined a national news agency and among the first television journalists. We had no television in India, no television news in India. So yes, uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome Anu and uh, the uh, company, uh, the Global Economics Research uh, Arm of McKinsey works in areas of labor markets, growth, technology and productivity. Over to you, Anu. Thank you, Poonam. Uh, one of the, I think, very energizing aspects of coming to this annual think tank summit in India for me in particular is uh, that I'm exposed to areas that actually we as McKinsey Global Institute don't do work in, right? So the morning session, I think, was very representative of that. Uh, foreign policy, uh, geopolitics is certainly not something we do look at. Um, and, and the topic that we have at hand for discussion now is actually much more, I think, a local topic. It's certainly influenced by a set of global forces, but the root causes, the drivers, and the opportunities tend to be very local in nature. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's also a topic that's very ripe for increased uh, interventions, thinking, research, and action by think tanks, particularly in this part of the world. So as, as we do work on this topic globally, we find that in uh, Europe, certainly, in the US increasingly, uh, in the development community that's focused on Africa to a very great extent, questions of diversity and women in particular are quite high up there on the agenda. And we find actually in Asia, this is much less the case. And in South Asia, I would say, also much less the case because uh, the topics are very complex and think tanks in general have sort of focused on one or the other part of the beast or the elephant, so to speak. Uh, but the solutions on this complex topic actually are quite, I mean, require a sort of integrating role which is a little bit harder to play. So there is a big space here. Quite apart from the think tank sector being one that has, as Jim said, its own opportunity to promote diversity, which maybe we're not doing such a bad job of in the overall scheme of things, uh, but also as a topic for research and intervention. So I have taken the liberty of uh, presenting the case for this kind of argument, leveraging some of the research we've done, and therefore the PowerPoint, which has some facts and figures. I hope it's visible. If anyone's interested in any of the research, I'm happy to share it. It's all available on our website, and just in the interest of presenting uh, McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, in case you don't know us, one of the features about us is that we don't do any paid or commissioned work or any consulting or any policy advocacy. Uh, so we are not, th though, though we are a part of McKinsey and Company, we, are not a, we, are not, we don't do consulting or paid work. And therefore, all of our work is funded by the company and it's available in the public domain for everyone to use. Uh, so that said, I think the first question is why is this whole topic of gender and women in particular so important? And we frame it as a starting point from an economic perspective in GDP terms. And we say uh, if you look at a hundred different countries around the world and then zoom in on Asia as a case in point, uh, we find that there's actually a, a very large sort of potential economic value that could be unlocked or captured by more women participating in the workforce on more equal terms. This is not a scenario or a simulation that assumes all countries around the world look exactly like Sweden or exactly like Norway because that's very unrealistic. What this says is we all start at different levels of parity or disparity in terms of three factors of relating to workforce in terms of the, particip the participation rates of women versus men, so there's one disparity there, in terms of the average hours that working women work relative to working men, working women typically work less hours, uh, and in terms of the kinds of sectors, jobs, and occupations that women are engaged in, which are typically less productive sectors and therefore less paying sectors. So there is an income gap built in which is correlated to gender there. So if you look at these three starting points of disparity and you look around the world at regional peer countries and say, who has actually improved on these dimensions rapidly? And then relative to that benchmark, say, what if every country could improve as, as fast as its best performing sort of peer nation? What could that economic opportunity look like? And those are the numbers here 
12 trillion globally, four and a half trillion in Asia Pacific. A big chunk from higher workforce participation by women, but also from the other two levers of ours and the kinds of sectors and jobs women are engaged in. Now, GDP is a limited concept. We all understand that. Women's contribution, and indeed anyone's contribution, can go beyond what is accounted for as GDP in our market economy context. But it's a useful, uh, uh, it's a useful element or construct to really think about greater economic opportunity and prosperity for everyone. Now, this chart, the bars, the horizontal bars on this chart are talking about the percent uplift possible in the scenario that I just talked about by country. So for the world or for Asia, on average, these numbers would reflect an 11 to 12 percent higher GDP or economy size in 2030 relative to where they would be otherwise. But the orange bar is India, where the relative opportunity is actually the highest. Uh, not necessarily the highest in dollar terms, but the relative uh, opportunity is the highest, which reflects that some countries in our region have actually improved women's workforce representation at pretty encouraging rates, so we have a high benchmark. Uh, but in India, this is, has been largely stagnant or even somewhat declining, so we have a pretty dismal forward-looking outlook in the absence of some interventions to actually change that. And the number on the right, just 25% of our workforce, whether organized or unorganized, informal or formal, just 25% of the labor force in India is women, which sets us at a very different place compared to many other Asian countries as well as more developed countries. We then look at aspects of women's equality that go beyond workforce. So workforce is one pillar, equality in all kinds of work. But then equality in society, we believe, is an equally important and very interrelated pillar. And here, in the, in the interest of sort of, again, comparing and contrasting India and other countries, we essentially look at a multiple set of indicators that span, you know, what is women's access to essential services to begin with, where we look at education and health, financial access or financial services, access to technology. So that's one important bucket of parity. The second is legal protection and political voice. How do laws of different kinds, do they empower women sufficiently uh, compared to men again? And uh, is there uh, uh, political representation at different levels and how does that compare? And finally, we look at the bucket of physical security where we, it's very hard to measure accurately as we all know, uh, but we look at things like intimate partner violence, we look at things like child marriage, we look at things like uh, the sex ratio at birth, just as indicators of women's role in society that goes beyond some of the other harder aspects. And across these indicators, if you actually uh, build an index or a measure of how every country stands relative to every other, there are some interesting findings which are essentially summarized here. So the vertical axis is the country's position on gender equality in work, both paid and unpaid work. The horizontal access is a measure of gender equality in society, which is those essential services I talked about, as well as legal, political, and physical uh, security. Now, the first takeaway is that there is actually a high degree of correlation between these two axes. One can't really, on a sustained basis, make progress on women's economic empowerment without social empowerment. Uh, and it's hard to say which, what's the chicken and what's the egg, but the two definitely do go hand in hand over a period of time. The second takeaway is that the countries at the extreme right, top, tend to be developed countries, they tend to be European countries, so they are high income countries, but there are interesting examples like the Philippines in Asia, a middle income country which has achieved high levels on both. Um, and then if you turn your gaze more to the left side of this chart, what you see is that uh, Africa has a lot of diversity, but there are countries like Nigeria called out there where women play a bigger role in the workforce, although their social equality or equality in society is actually quite limited. And then in contrast, you see India and Bangladesh, which is very typical of South Asia, where there is a big opportunity to advance on both workforce parity as well as societal parity. So whichever way we look at it, I think with, with the progress that's been made, 
it's a big opportunity for us in the region and for India in particular. The reasons why this is so, uh, societal attitudes play a big role globally, everywhere in the world, but again, I would say particularly in this part of the world. And these are just three survey indicators from the World Values Survey that look at some of the very underlying beliefs that men, women, across generations, across socioeconomic strata actually have about what their role should be in society, in the family, and in work. Uh, and this, uh, this is changing. Uh, it does change by education. Possibly the attainment of tertiary education is a very important predictor or trigger point for how some of these attitudes can change. Uh, but that said, they're very, very deeply ingrained and they do influence or in some ways cap and limit uh, the kind of economic dividends you can get out of greater investments uh, uh, socially in women. The other uh, interesting aspect is the huge within country variation in uh, the status of women or more importantly in I think the role that they play. And this is a simple uh, indicator of labor force participation rates. Uh, the dots that you see, the orange dots are the states of India and the dots in the other countries, China, Indi Indonesia and Philippines are their respective provinces or states. Uh, variation within India is actually uh, probably the highest that we've seen. Uh, ranges of women's workforce participation relative to men range from you know, benchmarks which are comparable to the Middle East to all the way to uh, you know, a Latin American country like Brazil or Argentina. Huge variation and any solutions, interventions therefore need to be uh, much more local and much more tailored to cultural as well as economic conditions across each of these states. Um, this is an interesting suggestion uh, that tells you two things. This is looking at labor force participation rates for women in India by education bracket. The dotted line is women without formal skills training or hereditary skills training. The orange line is when they are formally trained. I think there are two important messages on this chart. One is that there tends to be a U-shaped curve if you look at education brackets, if you look at even income brackets, which means that women in India or in many developing countries tend to be in the workforce if they are poor uh, or if uh, they are involved in very informal agricultural uh, and those kinds of work opportunities where uh, entry barriers are very low and also choices are not, uh, you don't really have choices. So women's participation tends to be a little bit higher there. And then there's a dip as the family attains a sort of emerging middle class status or education rates go up a little bit. There seems to be a withdrawal from the workforce for societal reasons. There seems to be a withdrawal from the workforce because at that level of education, the opportunity cost is not obvious. The, opportunity, the job opportunities for women are not commensurate with what they'd have to give up. And then it rises a little bit as opportunities improve with tertiary or higher education. So as India structurally moves through uh, you know, higher educational and income growth and advancement as a nation, some of these uh, elements might actually drag down women's labor force participation before it bumps up again. And that is what we're seeing. But the orange line tells us that structurally the whole curve can be raised through an intervention. In this case, it's skills training. It's probably debatable whether if you scale this up across the country, it's possible only through skills training. Probably not. Many interventions are required, but the curve can get raised up structurally and this could potentially boost uh, you know, economic empowerment for women. Uh, one important feature of how this can happen is women's uh, access and ability to uh, uh, being business owners. So across the region, we've seen that uh, pretty dramatic changes have been achieved when women have access to the internet, technology, financial capital, and become entrepreneurs of some kind connected to larger value chains. Um, in this context, India's position and South Asia's position really, relative to other countries again on the female to male ratio on some of these 
parameters of internet access, uh, access to finance and so on are of concern and would need to be addressed. Um, and another cautionary note I think for us is this data actually pertains to the formal or organized sector, so it's company data really. And, and we look at a pipeline to say what percentage of women at every stage from the pool of college educated women to entry level, middle management and senior management, what percentage are women? Uh, and even on this dimension where you would expect gender norms and societal attitudes to be a lot more uh, supportive of parity, you see a very sharp drop off in terms of the share of women who go to college versus the share of women who actually enter co corporate life at, at entry level and then a much more severe drop off in middle and senior management. To Poonam's point, how do you actually survive uh, a lot of societal expectations about the role that you play as you go through different life stages? That's a very real challenge in countries like India. Finally, uh, on the positive side, uh, uh, th there are really no silver bullets or single solutions. So the field is, I think, ripe for think tanks to do a lot of work to say, you know, what can really work and how can learnings from uh, countries that have gone through this journey but in very different contexts be tailored and contextualized to situations that we see here. But various buckets of interventions have had uh, impact and these are just Asian examples and there are many more examples from other parts of the world but across Asia we've seen that a, a very concerted focus on thinking about uh, family support. So the first bucket, labor market policies that promote uh, leave, uh, child care support, child care subsidies even have been successful. Uh, the market forces here talk about the role of uh, things like the, you know, technology, e-commerce, and potentially even sectors where it's been very important from a sector perspective to, to bring in more women because of skill gaps or labor shortages. Uh, such strategies have actually been quite successful. Uh, thinking about public infrastructure with a gendered lens, uh, uh, regardless of, of what the intent of this is, but really, uh, if you think about it, the, the hours that women don't spend in paid work are actually a form of subsidy, because women are bearing the burden of doing a lot that public goods or public infrastructure should be doing for them or for their families. Uh, and therefore, having that lens to thinking about household infrastructure, transportation, and so on is extremely important. And, and can have success on the supply side. Um, and then finally, the role, as we talked about this morning, of a very active sort of community-based support and network at multiple levels on multiple issues uh, is again uh, clearly something that can have impact. The challenge is that these are areas where typically either think tanks or government agencies or companies for their part have all had you know, some role to play, some interventions, but it's been hard to stitch together a national vision or coalition, or even a state level vision or coalition that ties together many of these initiatives and makes that change happen at a larger scale. So in summary, no silver bullet, lots of different things, some risk of everybody trying to do something, but no sort of way of stitching these together in a, in a manner that is mutually supportive. Uh, and I think, uh, a lot that think tanks can do to address the opportunities in this area. Thank you, Anu, for giving uh, insight into the complex issues uh, which uh, kind of uh, drive the uh, participation of women in the workforce and uh, uh, as a result into the GDP. Uh, only two issues before I open the floor for questions is, uh, one is a question of reservations. Now, uh, since you talked about the Indian case particularly, and maybe in the Asian case, we have huge amount of reservations. So have reservations help women? And the second uh, question, and when I talk of reservations, I would also like to include uh, even, uh, uh, you know, in more advanced, in more developed countries, you now have a specific clause which says diversity, women are welcome, you know. So that issue, if you could shed some light on, and the opportunities, the availability of opportunities. 
I would like your comments on that. Spot on. I think both questions are very important. Um, on the question of reservations, um, I think it, it's interesting that uh, while I think clearly to our mind, just having a quota or a reservation on women's workforce participation may not be the most helpful uh, approach going forward. And I certainly believe that, so that's not something I would advocate. But it's very interesting that the two interventions that have actually been proven to be successful in many parts of the world, the first is on, in the political space. Uh, at the end of the day, countries which have had high shares of women at national parliamentary levels uh, or lower levels or local government levels, in many cases have found their roots in some form of political quota or the other whether at the level of political parties, you know, self-imposing quotas on the tickets that they issue to women candidates, or legislation that actually mandates a certain reservation. So the political space in particular has been quite intractable without uh, reservations to actually support or trigger that behavior. Uh, uh, and, and the economic space may be different, but this is interesting. The second thing that we have learned from looking at companies uh, and corporate practices around diversity in a large number of companies around the world, cutting across stages of development and so forth, is that there are a lot of elements of uh, you know, HR policies and good practices and, and, and you know, building the business case. Many things are required, but the one thing that is really required is an explicit commitment from the top that says diversity is important and we have a target in mind of X percent. It doesn't have to be a quota. Many companies or most successful companies would not say that you need, you know, this is a quota and we're going to fill all these seats with women. So, you know, merit, of course, is, is uh, non-negotiable. That said, if we are not moving towards our target, we need to get into understanding what those barriers are that that make it a non-level playing field, and we need to tackle those barriers. So the solution is not in the quota, but in the mindset that says, if we are not moving towards a certain number that we have in mind, it's a way of forcing the debate around what's coming in the way, and why is the playing field not really a level playing field? So a bit, I, I'm sorry if it's a dodgy answer, but I think that's, that's the way at least I would think about it. Yes, please, the questions. Uh, do we take two or three in a bunch? Yeah. Hello. Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm from the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy in Chennai. Um, I'd just like to make two interventions on this um, excellent thing by Anu. One is that uh, we as a think tank have supported studies on women and work and women's issues. There was one very interesting study which I thought I should share with you. So this is more a sharing of uh, view. We supported a scholar who studied women in pain. She studied uh, agricultural women workers in rural Bihar. And she found out that uh, women reporting pain to a public health service are less likely to be taken seriously than a man reporting pain. And uh, it was across both private and public sectors. And it is assumed that women uh, and pain are um, sort of, it's assumed that it's quite natural for them, whereas it's, and uh, that's something which was quite startling. And that leads me to the next related issue is about access. Uh, we also had uh, published articles about menstrual health in which it was still found that in India, access to menstrual hygiene is still elusive for many women. And on a related note, access to water, which is very important for women's health as well, is doubly burden for the women because women are also water barriers, water barriers, largely in rural areas. There's a study in progress which we'll be publishing shortly. So I just thought I'd bring it to Anu's knowledge about these two things. And if that is, if you've come across any such issue and you think it's relevant. Yes, please. Uh, you talked about uh, corporate practices and HR practices, and also cited the example of uh, Norway. Now, let's take the example of India. How come that under the Companies Act 2013, we have provided under Section 135 that we'll have at least one woman on the board? 
But you find that all big groups also, now any group you talk about, they have not been able to fill up those positions. I don't think there is any dearth of women, I think. Why does it happen? And why we should not be, you know, uh, catching up uh, with Norway, Finland, and Denmark? I don't think there is any reason why we should not be doing that. Why does it happen? Yes, please. and participation in the, in the workforce. So there is a correlation between the two and there is one outlier among developed countries and I was just curious to know who that is. <laughs> Sorry. Let's deal with the specific question first. That's the blue triangle, right? Yes. So, uh, Developed countries by this definition are based on per capita GDP, high income countries. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that's probably uh, one of the countries in the Middle East, which okay. has a high per capita GDP, but for a bunch of reasons. Okay. Well, I may be wrong, but let me, no, it's not the blue triangle. Did you mean the, the, the black triangle? triangle? The, uh, Did you mean left. the black triangle? No, 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 here, no, no. the, the right blue down. one. On the left hand side. Oh, the blue one, I see. Blue ones. Yeah, the other one, uh, the, the one above yeah. Bangladesh. I, yeah, I suspect it's Saudi Arabia. Okay. I, I will get back to you on that. To know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay um, let's come to the question on women on boards. Um, I think. I think the answers, so, so first of all, just to put it into context, board representation is one important aspect of diversity in companies, uh, but, but potentially uh, for us, diversity within the operating uh, teams or staff of companies that go all the way up to uh, you know, senior management teams is arguably more important. Boards have a large representation of non-executive members as well. So diversity does play a role there, uh, but it's much more interesting actually to look at uh, the executive parts of the company where it's even a bigger challenge because the law doesn't mandate that you, know, you don't have to have a certain uh, gender mix for any of those levels. Uh, if you think about the boards per se, uh, I think a couple of challenges. Companies would say that, uh, the pool of women who play these roles also needs to develop in step with such laws. Uh, I think the, the, the appropriate response to that kind of argument is that when you have a law, the supply side responds, and there have been actually concerted efforts by uh, firms and other institutions to actually uh, identify and expand that pool of women. Typically, board appointments are very clubby, very cozy. You tend to appoint people you know, Women are not parts of those clubs and cozy circles uh, by definition, the starting point. So how do you actually uh, open up that pool and, 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 and create like a cadre of potential board members for want of a better way to phrase it, right? So that's one thing that needs to happen. The second thing I think is that the numbers disguise the fact that not all even women board members are playing a role that's commensurate with the expectation. Sometimes family appointments come in the way. It's not to say that you know, family members can't be effective board members, but uh, the, 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 the effectiveness and the contribution of the board member uh, across the board, I would say, does need to be raised as well, which is as important a question as just achieving the number. Uh, my research has brought out, I have done a research on 565 companies. And my research very clearly pinpoints that wherever we have a woman on the board, number of senior managers, let us say GM, DGM, AGM, senior manager, manager, you know, that number has increased. Yeah. So that's one thing. Yeah. Then why do we, you know, we pay fines? Number no, two. I, uh, sorry, we, uh, just to respond to the first, I think yeah. uh, that's absolutely true, particularly where the board members you're talking about are drawn from the executive uh, parts of the organization as opposed to non-executive roles. We've seen that as well. When senior management teams cross the tipping point of 30 to 40% women, 
suddenly there are diversity benefits throughout the organization. I think the second part you didn't tell, I just uh, half a Entries, minute. please, we'll have no supplementaries because we'll just no take one last question. The nod has been given to me to wind okay. up this session. Sorry, uh, you know, uh, I did a little bit, I wrote a short paper for the Forum 2000 on dynasties in politics. And uh, the, our finding was that uh, actually uh, dynasty promotes women in politics as well as uh, the specific Indian problem of uh, castes. So scheduled castes, scheduled tribes are able to be better represented through a dynastic uh, process. You know, it's counterintuitive and one would want to argue against dynasty, but certainly for women in politics, that uh, worked out. Uh, so my question in one sense is that we cannot then assume that more women in politics is going to have a beneficial impact on women in the economy. Fair point. Thank you for clarifying that. The next session, please. Thank you. Happy to take questions later. later. later.